May the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You heard the first lesson of the battle of Israel against the Philistines. They were defeated. They thought, of course, that God was on their side because he had been on their side when he gave them the whole promised land and he had always given these victory after victory after victory until this day. What's wrong? They had a good idea. They went back home and they picked up the Ark of the Covenant. And they re-challenged the Philistines into battle again, this time bringing along the Ark with them. Certainly this important symbol, this important presence of God in their midst would guarantee them the victory, only to be defeated again. They thought God was on their side, but he wasn't. The battle for righteousness is a battle that we confront daily. And we think that we come out pretty well and we'll have the victory. The battle for righteousness is against Satan and all the powers of evil. And of ourselves, like Israel of old, we would be defeated. Even though we have all the symbols of what the life of righteousness is, even though we go to church regularly, even though we're Lutheran, there's no warranty that God is always on our side in the battle of righteousness. I want to read to you how Jesus confronted Satan, the arch enemy. I'm going to take this from Matthew chapter 4. Jesus had just been baptized. And before he begins his public ministry in all of his preaching and all of his miracles and even into his own death and resurrection. He's led into the wilderness, into the desert to be tempted. Do you know who led him there to be tempted? Satan? Uh-uh. Listen. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. God's spirit led him there. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, and he knew that Jesus was. He said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands, and you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and all this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. And you know, the devil never again appeared to Jesus in his ministry. He was defeated. He knew as powerful as he was, he was against a more powerful even force than himself. And his ultimate defeat would come at the end of Jesus' ministry, perhaps three years later, when Jesus rose from the dead. How do you picture Jesus being confronted by the devil? What kind of image do you see the devil? Do you see a snake hissing through his fangs? <laughs> do you see a horrendously ugly picture of a person maybe or some kind of 
figure or monster with horns growing out of his head and all red and a tail behind him and carrying a pitchfork? I don't think so. You know what my imagination pictures Satan as being? An affable, kindly man walking along in the desert, a stranger to Jesus who recognizes and knows who Jesus is, but say, hey, man, you look terrible. I mean, Jesus had been starving for 40 days. He's starving, and he looks like a mess. And he says, well, look, why don't you just say to that stone right there, it looks like a loaf of bread, and say, change it into a loaf of bread and feed yourself. It's so easy. What was the first temptation that Satan said to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3? See this fruit? It's delicious. Take and eat. And she did and gave it to Adam, and he ate of it also. Jesus, it's good for you. Look at it. Take a loaf of bread and eat. But Jesus said to him, No. You live not by bread, but by obedience to the word of God. And God said, don't eat of the fruit in the middle of the garden. Adam and Eve ate. They lost the battle for righteousness that day. The second temptation. Satan takes Jesus now and takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, now jump, you won't die. And what did he say to Adam and Eve? Genesis 3. Eat, you won't die. Direct contradiction to what God had said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And Jesus said to Satan when he comes with that second temptation, don't put the Lord, don't put your God to the test. I'm not going to do what you say. Jesus knows he's going to die, and he came into this world to die, but not in obedience to the command of Satan. So Satan tries the third time. Shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He says, this is yours. You could have the glory. You don't have to go through the pain and agony of life here. Perhaps even thinking of the suffering he would endure on the Holy Week and die. All this glory could be yours. Just worship me. And what did he say to Adam and Eve? Eat, number one, you will not die, number two, and three, you will know good from evil. You will be like God. You will know just what is good for you, and you will know what is bad for you, which is a lie. He's lying through his fangs again. But Jesus said to him, in direct answer to what his temptation is, you shall worship only the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Jesus, in his righteousness, wins the battle. And Adam and Eve lost the battle, just like you and I often do. I'll come to the grace of God later on. So, how does Satan approach us? With temptations to do horrendous evils? I think not. I think he's this kind of kindly, affable liar who convinces you and me that this is the best thing for us to do and it's not the will of God. Let me go through with you the Ten Commandments and just point out a way Satan is a lot more clever than my thoughts and leads us into temptation and we fall into sin in many more ways 
than even the examples that I'm going to come up with. We think we're righteous enough, but we don't always put God in first place as the first commandment says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And we don't. Now, second commandment, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You're just freshly surprised. You're very excited about something that just happened. Oh my God! Isn't that familiar? All the time. Everybody does it. Now, would you say your mother's name? Oh, my Matilda, or Paula is my mother. Oh, my Paula! I have more respect for my mother than to use her name so flippantly. But we take the name of that which is holy and above all names and say, Oh, my God, oh, my Lord, it's hot out there today. Without thinking, because everybody does it, we get in the habit too, and Satan has won that little battle. Take the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh, I know, I'm talking to people who come to church. What happens if you're going on a camping trip? It's so easy to skip it. It's so easy to forget your personal worship in your prayer life. We fall into that temptation all the time. Fourth commandment, you should not kill. Well, I don't know about you, but I've never killed anybody. I'm not a murderer. <laughs> Jesus says, whoever hates his brother or sister is guilty of the same sin. Maybe murder is carrying it to the ultimate, hatred to the ultimate of killing the one you hate. But I have hated, and so have you, I suspect it. And we sin against that commandment. I, that's the fifth commandment. I've, I've skipped one there. Um, not having a heart for other people, that kind of thing. The fourth commandment is honor your father and mother. Uh, I missed my notes here and I skipped one. Um, okay. Obey the authorities whom God has placed in front of you, not just your mother and your father. I drove over the hill today and there was a speed limit placed there by the authority of God's given government. Thou shalt not go over 65 miles an hour. Need I say more? I didn't go much over it. <laughs> it's like saying, that, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not a thief. I haven't stolen much. I only stole a little bit. But if you steal 25 cents, or if you steal $25 million, you're still a thief, aren't you? And I don't say you disobey in great ways, but we do. We disobey the authorities that God has put in front of us. Do not commit adultery. Sow your oats. I haven't watched a television set. I don't even like to watch television much anymore because continually the young man and the young woman are living together, are having sex with each other, apart from marriage, everything but what God has ordained. And that's what everybody does. So our kids, not only our kids, we adults do the same thing. And if we don't actually commit the act of adultery, we lust after others. And we fall in this battle against Satan. Steal? No, I'm not really a thief. I just fudge a little bit of my tax somewhat, but not really a thief. Eighth commandment, bear false witness. Ladies, have you ever gossiped? No, no, no. Men, we have. A lot of times on Sunday morning when the pastor has a bad sermon or does some kind of stunt that you didn't like, what do you do? You serve a little bit of roast pastor with your roast beef at Sunday dinner. And you don't lift him up. Or we do that to other people too. 
How about coveting, 9 and 10? You ever been jealous of somebody else at work with you that they got a better deal than you and you deserve it more? You covet the lives and success of other people you know and it's so much easier for them? You see, Satan is very subtle and he pulls us in. And even though everybody does it, does not make it right if it's not the will of God. And the battle of righteousness goes on in these many ways and in hundreds of others and thousands of others every day in our life and we fall. When we pray, lead me not into temptation in the Lord's Prayer, we know we are going to be tempted, but we are praying, God, be on my side and help me to resist the temptation and to be victorious. And ultimately, we're never strong enough to win the battle of righteousness for ourselves. But God has done it for us. The battle for righteousness is the battle that has done away with sin, which Christ accomplished with his death and resurrection, the punishment for our sin, when he took upon it himself and went to that cross. And the victory is not only for him over against Satan when he rose again on the third day, but it's ours as well. And in our baptism, we join with Jesus, as Romans 6 says, not only in the death of Jesus, but thereby also in his resurrection. And the battle is won when God is on our side and give us, gives us the victory. So, my dear friends, the battle for righteousness is the battle to do better and to do the right thing and to do the better thing and to think about the subtle temptations of Jesus and overcome them more and more every day of our life. So fight the good fight. And God bless you. Amen. And the peace of God which is ours through Jesus Christ be yours. The victory is ours through him. Amen.